So thank you for the three students. You are in the right place uh, for those who joined uh, later. <laughs> it is uh, the seminar, but we gave uh, the word uh, to to these uh, three students because uh, they got uh, the fellowship and so they are working on this project. Of course, uh, the project may change during uh, the year. So let's back up. And uh, also the, the goal of this uh, third seminar, because it is a seminar in value creation, it is the third one of the seminar series launched by the Research Center. The first one was in January of uh, the challenge of responsible AI, where we address more ethical issues related to the algorithm. In the second one, we address the business model, uh, Internet of Things, crowds with Professor Christopher Tucci and Volvo. Uh, and it was a second subject the how AI is changing the business model. But today we have a, a third part of the story because there is a logic behind uh, linking all the seminar in the seminar series in value creation. And the focus today is to see how AI is changing more the ecosystem and the, which is the role of platform. And uh, it is a, a well debated topic uh, and a new topic, I could say. Uh, what is a platform, a, a digital platform, a business, a platform in the ecosystem, and uh, how the digital business ecosystem can be different compared to a, a traditional ecosystem. And in particular, which are the logic, uh, the competitive logic that are put in place by the companies or other platform to gain a competitive advantage or to keep their competitive advantage in the long term. And uh, we had the chance uh, to have today a, a top professor in this field. And I'm very honest in saying this is uh, Professor Omar El Savi from uh, University of Southern California, Marshall Business School. Is an uh, editor, now emeritus editor of, he uh, was editor for several, several years of MS Quarterly. He got uh, many prizes and uh, a huge number of articles uh, published in a top level journal uh, in information system mainly. But what is interesting in his perspective uh, is that uh, uh, he is looking at this phenomenon, so the logic of ecosystem, how platforms are competing from a multidisciplinary point of view. That's why he's talking with people from marketing, uh, even if uh, it's from uh, information system, but also artificial intelligence is part of this game. And uh, we, we decided so to, to invite him uh, today, and uh, thanks uh, for accepting our invitation. I want to add also the fact that uh, Professor Omar El Savi is part of our scientific committee inside the Institute, and uh, so his role is also to monitor our activities and to give input, uh, to improve uh, and to drive uh, the activities uh, of the, specifically of the research center I represent uh, today. Uh, we have not only Omar El Savi, so the logic of each seminar series is to bridge uh, uh, theory and practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the majority of you, some of you comes from the companies uh, and they want to learn uh, what the theory is telling them, which are the managerial implications. That's why in the philosophy of each seminar, uh, we have a top professor presenting us, opening up uh, the research, uh, the idea, and driving also PhD students, uh, uh, professor, to look at in a different way their subject. This is the first mission of each seminar. But at the same time, to open up the debate. And we invited today Florian Hutt, thanks for joining us, from Expedia Group, he is based in Geneva, and uh, he represents uh, the point of view of one of the platforms existing in the ecosystem. And so his role uh, will be to highlight the managerial implication coming up from uh, Omar El Savi and open up the debate. So we need uh, your question, our question are welcome because uh, this uh, seminar will drive maybe a research note, uh, opening up uh, a new research area on this topic. So I give the word uh, to Omar and uh, thanks uh, for joining us, for honoring uh, uh, with your speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, th hello, everyone. Uh, th thank you, uh, Margarita Renault, for inviting me today. And uh, thank you, Florian, for your willingness to debate. And I'm looking forward uh, to that. And uh, the other Monsieur Renault at the back will tell me if I'm uh, too far or too close to the microphone. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, the topic of today is, as Margarita was saying, uh, is about digital platform ecosystems. And I want to convince you that there's a change that's going on that goes uh, well beyond uh, uh, Google or even larger uh, companies like Expedia, but that the whole uh, business model of corporations is slowly shifting to a platform business model that looks more like an ecosystem than a company with closed uh, boundaries. And I think it's a very significant change. And uh, the question here today is, is this the next context for AI? So now that you have an AI in the middle of this uh, digital platform ecosystem environment, does, is that something very different? Or is it just business as usual with more complexity? So that's the question. I don't know the answer to the AI part, and that's kind of why uh, we're having uh, this debate. So just a little bit of history so you know where I'm coming from, and I'll do this uh, uh, very quickly. And uh, this is a picture of me when I completed my PhD on, on the left there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I started out uh, really designing strategic information systems. I was at the business school at Stanford. <laughs> And uh, I was interested in designing information systems for uh, CEOs of small high-tech companies and how they detected uh, threats and opportunities in the environment. So that's kind of how I started. And uh, then I went into uh, something called vigilant information systems, which were like executive information systems that alerted you when changes were happening. And, and, and that sort of took me to the theory end uh, uh, into information systems, uh, uh, design theory, and, and, and what that means. And then I realized that all these information systems were kind of up there and were not connected with operations. And so I started to uh, think of business processes and, uh, uh, you know, how to uh, link that to uh, supply chains and, and, and uh, uh, value chains that were IT-enabled. And in the process of doing that, I also became much more interested in digital business models and what that means. And uh, at a certain point in time, uh, we realized that nobody really knew what a digital business model was, and depending on which functional area you asked, they'll give you a different answer. And then I became interested in, in dynamic capabilities, which are IT-enabled. And then, you know, currently I'm, I'm interested in this digital platform capabilities. And so this is kind of my background. As you can see, there's no AI in it. And, uh, but I think it's an, it's an important context uh, uh, to think about, and, and that's kind of what we're doing today. In general, uh, you know, I'd like to think of myself as looking at uh, uh, digital business uh, strategy and turbulence. I like messy environments. I don't know why, but uh, I like things that change a lot. And uh, I worked in, as an engineer uh, before I went to, uh, back to graduate school. And so I'm always interested in practice and field studies. And I think, you know, the most, I was just mentioning, the most interesting ideas are the ones you get from managers who sort of say, you know, I've been thinking, I've been observing this for six months, and I noticed that, right? And it's somebody who's really thought about and, and that gives a lot of insight that one can think about in terms of uh, answering uh, questions. So that's kind of where I come from. So let's, let's just look at where we are at uh, this point. And so if, if uh, you know, I like turbulence and messiness, but actually at this point, digital turbulence is the norm, right? I don't think it's gonna go away. I don't think it's okay, let's just get this moving and then everything will be stable. It's not going to be and it's going to continue to uh, disrupt us, and we had better enjoy the ride. I think there's a fun part of it, and, and uh, it's important uh, to take advantage of it. And the picture of the, the baby and the, uh, and the dog there on the, on the left or, uh, is, is just to indicate that 
for people of that age, they don't even see it. It's like part of the environment and you know, this is, this is life, so to speak. Um, and so, so as the thing says on the, on the bottom, change is the best equilibrium. I don't think we are going to go away from change. The other thing that uh, I think is, is something to think about is that maybe at this point the world has flipped and uh, digital has become the foreground and physical has become the background, right? And maybe thinking about it this way is more useful at this point. Of course, they're, they're both there and we live in the physical world. But is it more useful at this point to think of digital first and physical second as we design our organizations and, and strategies and, and what have you? And <clears throat> I'm originally from Egypt, and so an inverted pyramid is my symbol of disruption. And uh, this, as you all know, technology disrupts a lot of basic assumptions. Things that we take for granted have changed. Boundaries are no longer the same, and you could go on and on. And what it also does, it gives you the opportunities for all kinds of new digital business models. And that's kind of the butterfly uh, on the right there that uh, you know, takes you to areas and, and types of business models that we haven't seen before and give us lots of new opportunities uh, uh, <coughs> that are exciting. So th this is kind of uh, what I'd like to convince you of, in a, in a sense, is that the next form of the corporation is actually a digital platform ecosystem. So it is no longer the corporation that has closed boundaries, but it's one that interacts with a digital platform ecosystem and stakeholders around that. <coughs> Whether it's customers or suppliers or communities or what have you. Uh, these slides come from MIT, actually, where they've sort of looked and, and, and seen that there's an explosion of platform companies you know, we know all the larger ones, whether it's uh, Google or, or <coughs> Apple or what have you, but there are also uh, clusters in different industries that are starting to have more and more uh, platform uh, structures, and certainly the travel industry and Expedia is, is a great uh, example of that. <coughs> and I don't know why they have TripAdvisor there other than uh, <laughs> Expedia. <laughs> It's a spin-off, okay. <laughs> right. uh, okay, so, so this is the, the talk plan. So first I'm going to, to try and tell you my views about digital platform ecosystems, and you can agree and disagree with them. And then I'm going to talk about research implications, and my area is information systems, so I'll stick a little bit more to that. And uh, <coughs> I think uh, Margarita kindly uh, uh, distributed two papers of, of mine, and uh, I'm not going to talk about them, but their background, if you want, I'll touch uh, on them in, during the talk. And then what that means for uh, methodological and theoretical implications. And then the last part in, is, and I guess that's supposed to be French, uh, etu AI. What about you, AI? How do you fit in this? And uh, are you going to change things in this setting? And is this the next context for AI? <clears throat> yeah, and uh, next time I do that, I'm going to have Pepper deliver my talk. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what is a digital platform ecosystem? So there are different kinds of platforms. We tend to, t to talk about them in the same kind of breath, but there, there, there are some differences. There are simple platforms. This is an example of a company that does e-commerce platforms uh, for gaming companies. And so it's got functionality on the platform. Uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, you know, there's a loyalty program. There are things that check for age for games. There's a way to return games. You know, it's got all kinds of functionalities, but it's a simple platform. You know, the, it's, it's at the company. It connects with customers. That's about it. Then we have what you call foundational platforms. And these are very technical. This is uh, 
Linux, this is Android, and this is a different type of foundational platform uh, <coughs> that uh, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with. And then finally, whoops, the more interesting one is this third kind, which you might call uh, platform-mediated networks. And, and certainly uh, Expedia is, is one of those, and this, this one here is, is eBay. And uh, you, you, know, you have what you might call these network effects, where the different sides of the platform, or even the same side, uh, uh, you know, affect each other. So the more uh, buyers you have, the more sellers you get. Uh, and, and there's all these uh, uh, interaction effects that actually allow things to sometimes grow very quickly and scale up uh, very quickly, and then you get these network effects. And, and these are the more interesting ones, and, and these are the ones where, uh, you know, uh, business digital platform ecosystems can be thought around. <clears throat> I like to point out the example of Under Armour as an example of a company that has become a platform company because, you know, it was a regular company to start with. Uh, Under Armour, for I'm sure some of you uh, know, uh, they, they s sell uh, athletic uh, apparel, right? And it was first designed to be under uh, football gear uh, or American football gear so that uh, the players wouldn't sweat as much basically and so that's why it's called Under Armour. And, and then at a certain point, and you know, it's, it's been doing okay, it's not a very large company. Uh, this is a revenue of a couple of years ago, I think. Uh, <clears throat> but you know, they have a few hiccups, but they've pretty much grown quite well. But then, you know, few years ago, they said, no, we, we're going to reimagine our business and we're going to switch from apparel to networked fitness, right? And so we're going to sell an experience. We're not going to sell. Yes, we will have our clothes, but that's not what we're about. And we're going to take advantage of the Internet of Things that is now changing some of the business models that are possible. And so what they went and did was they went and bought a number of companies that have apps related to running and fitness and, uh, you know, uh, what did I eat today, what calories do I have, uh, uh, you know, competing with others who are running at the same time, oh, I, I ran faster than you did. And, uh, you know, through this platform, they've created a, a community that uh, the last time I looked was 190 million uh, users. That's a very large number, right? Uh, and now they are interacting around uh, that platform. So what has happened is that uh, if you look at uh, Kevin Plank, the uh, CEO of the company, uh, his milieu has changed, so to speak, right? And his ecosystem has changed. And so he started interacting with IBM. He goes to the Consumer Electronics Show. It's, it's a different set of ecosystem partners that he's dealing with. And they've switched from a product-oriented company <coughs> to an experience-oriented company. And uh, it's changed their uh, customer engagement model as well and the way that they interact with their customers. And so they have a, a, a connected uh, fitness platform and they have uh, connected the apps around that, the ones that they just acquired, and, and they have connected devices, whether they're on shoes or Fitbits or what have you. Uh, they also sell their shirts and shoes, so that's still part of it. But now they have advertisers who are, re are generating, I don't know, 30 to 35% of their revenue, who are advertising food and, I don't know, uh, fitness things and, and wherever else. And, and that has changed its whole business model and its revenue model and its <coughs> ecosystem. And they've kind of switched from selling apparel and products to becoming a platform company, right? Which is open to all of these communities and they have to manage that community now. It's an important part of that. So it's not just the Googles that, that do that, but any company that thinks that this is a good strategy for them 
will can can go in that direction and change its business model uh, the way that it 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 generates revenue uh, how it interacts with its outside uh, ecosystem and certainly they've had to uh, up their digital capabilities and increase their digital workforce so this is you know uh, it's not a cheap thing to do and there are certain resources that you need uh, but you know you can become a platform business if it makes uh, sense to you and and basically when, when you become a platform business you create value between um, you know producers and consumers um, you enable value creating interactions in your ecosystem and uh, <clears throat> you know you you allow um, platform participants to benefit from everyone else in that ecosystem, right? So there's a question of uh, creating value and sharing value uh, at the same time. And of course, a lot of platform owners uh, want to be the orchestrator of the ecosystem. So I'm sure that uh, Expedia has its own ideas on. You know, we're the center of the universe here, and we'd like to be that. Uh, <clears throat> but certainly, you can still participate in an ecosystem as, I don't want to say a minor participant, but you don't have to be the orchestrator, and you can participate in multiple uh, uh, ecosystems as well. And the fact that it's digital makes a difference, right? Because of all these connections and interactions and different rules uh, and different uh, characteristics. Uh, <clears throat> And um, I think I'm, I'm just going to skip this. Um, but you know, here's an example, uh, which is not mine, it's, it's of a connected car ecosystem, right? And so you have a number of, of, of uh, uh, platforms uh, for connected cars, Android, Auto, Apple CarPlay, Open Car, who knows what, what else. And then you can see you know how different the different players are. There's the apps, the connectivity, the auto manufacturers, the suppliers, the software people, the semiconductor, uh, you know, insurance companies, and you, you know, it's it's a whole set of uh, uh, connections, and they each provide and share value uh, in a in a in a different way. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, as, as I mentioned, in, 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 in these digital business ecosystems, there are larger, super major players, and, and you can see that, uh, you know, these major uh, or super major platform owners are worth uh, a lot of money, all right? And so there's something there that's, that's happening that's different. And, and then there are, you know, other uh, platforms that uh, are part of, uh, of this as well, they're large, they're not as large, but again, uh, generating a lot of uh, perceived value at least. And then there are all these little minions that are a part of that, and that's still a very uh, productive uh, thing to do, right? And, uh, you, you know, you, 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 in each uh, uh, ecosystem, you have what are called keystone players, who are kind of the, uh, you know, providing, uh, a lot of the value uh, for others, uh, and uh, you know you can you can choose to have uh, to operate in a smaller niche or a larger niche, and there are all kinds of uh, you know uh, clusters and structures in there, but the interactions are are very different and the rules are different. So let's talk about some properties that are different, and maybe it has some implications for AI. Maybe it doesn't, but let's let's think about that. So first of all, uh, you know, as uh, as I mentioned, uh, in in a in a, eco a digital platform ecosystem, you have to uh, understand how to leverage the capabilities of others, right? And uh, so you have to understand how to take advantage of partners, and it's not you, you just doing uh, things. Uh, you also have to understand that. Uh, you will get very diverse partners as, uh, uh, you know, for example, in that car uh, e ecosystem, you're now dealing with, uh, you know, all these software companies that you didn't do business with before, uh, you know, a different kind of ecosystems, uh, telecom providers, what have you. Uh, there's also uh, continuous learning and disequilibrium. Uh, this is not like you find a position and you stay like this. 
No, it's, it's a continuous adjustment as, as things change, and, and that's part of the fun, in a way. And there's learning that goes on uh, all the time. Now, multi-sided platforms, I, I, I call that the tyranny here, because there are many opportunities for creating and sharing value, but it's challenging to manage all that and coordinate all these uh, parts. Um, you also get these very rapid scaling, and, and we've seen many unicorns, so to speak, uh, because of network effects that scale up really quickly, uh, and that drives growth. You also have all kinds of new uh, business models based on platforms. I mean, you, we've seen what uh, Airbnb and Uber have done. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, if you've been following Tesla, so people are wondering, no, is it a car company or is it really in the power business with their power wall where they want to control how, uh, uh, you know, the platform for charging uh, cars and other things at home. And, and, you know, you can go on and on, but it, it gives you new types of uh, business models that you didn't have before. There are also other things there, is that there are things that are becoming much more important. So managing transparency is much more important, right? You're very transparent uh, in a digital platform ecosystem. And, and that has a lot of implications, I think, for AI, right? And how that works and, and, and what to do about that. Reputation is very important. I mean, we all know the five stars and four stars and, and what have you, and, and how do you manage that? That's a real important part of, of your, your business model and, and uh, your strategy. We don't manage resources anymore. We manage community, right? Many of these are not our resources. It's, there are communities that uh, you have to manage and, uh, you know, many companies have vice presidents for community management. I don't know what uh, Expedia uh, does, but, uh, uh, you know, it's an important function. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's a question of not just creating value, but sharing the value for others. That's kind of how it works, and that's how an ecosystem uh, thrives. All right. So there are some... Uh, properties that are different here. And as time goes on, we'll, we'll, we'll discover some more and, 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 and what that means. And I think as we look over time, more and more companies are going to go in that direction. And, and the very form of uh, a corporation is going to change. I think uh, you know, that, that will be the new form of the corporation that doesn't have closed boundaries, but rather has all these uh, different partners that it creates and shares value. So what about uh, some of the research uh, implications? So if you, if you think of what has happened in the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years, uh, and uh, you look and see uh, how uh, the scope of strategic focus has changed, uh, <clears throat> And, and, and at the same time, you know, our, the turbulence level keeps increasing um, as compared to uh, uh, 20, 30 years ago. So initially, we used to have an enterprise focus, right? And it was my enterprise against your enterprise competing with each other. And the focus was on production. You know, let's get stuff out, let's provide services, uh, and let me uh, compete with that other company over here. And then in the 1990s, we got into supply chains and value chains. And it was my supply chain with my partners versus your supply chain with your partners. Right? And so we, we got into pipelines. It was still going from left to right, right, all the way to the customer. And then if you look at what's happening now, I think we've sort of switched from pipelines to platforms. And you know, a pipeline goes like this. You know, you, you get the product to the customer. A platform is, is more like this, right? You know, there are all kinds of different interactions going on in different directions, and it's not like a, a you know, a, a linear uh, pipeline uh, at all. So, so that's a change that uh, has happened in our strategic focus and how we think about it. And 
you know, if you if you are a strategy scholar, and and uh, and and maybe this is not of uh, interest to all of you, uh, but if you look at the repertoire of strategy over the years, uh, we used to have this thing called uh, strategy, and we still do strategy as positioning. Uh, this is uh, very much for the MBAs here, the Michael Porter approach to strategy. And basically, it's like this, right? You find a good position in an industry, and you just keep everybody out, you know? Competitors out, substitute. It's very anti-competitive, actually, but, and, uh, but it has persisted. And uh, that's why I have a picture of Queen Elizabeth there. <laughs> because, you know, it's kind of, she's, still, she's still the queen, right? Uh, and then in the uh, early 90s, we had strategy as a movement. And this came initially from Japan. And then there was a, a book that escaped a lot of attention. It was called Competing Against Time by Stark and Hout. And they sort of said, well, you know, if I can get flexibly and fast my product uh, to the customer more flexibly and fast than you can, then I have a competitive or strategic advantage. And, uh, uh, you know, that was a, a different way of thinking about it as, as movement. You know, I can move faster than you can. And then we got into this capability view, okay? So what can I do that you can't, right? I have the capability to do this, but you can't do that. And I've developed this competence that only I can make, and that gives me a strategic advantage. Uh, and then it's sort of the, the capability became more about dynamic capability. So, uh, you know, I, I can do this stuff, but I can reconfigure myself and, and be more flexible than you can. And then in the early 2000s, we got this uh, supply chain, collaborative value chain, synchronization. And, you know, it's like a kumbaya if you're... So, you know, if I can synchronize my value chain and supply chain and have visib information visibility, you know, four levels deep, uh, then we have a collaborative advantage and we can manage our supply chain much more strategically and, and that's kind of how we're going to do it. And then finally, at this point, we have another addition to that repertoire, which is, uh, you know, strategy as ecology, right? And so, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a model that says we exist in an ecosystem where we have to partner, we have to share and create value. Uh, that's not because we're nice, it's just because that's the way to thrive and survive in that type of environment. So it's not an altruistic model by uh, any sense. It's still, uh, you know, driven by uh, business issues and for the, for the, the, the interests of, of uh, being able to survive. And it's especially useful in, in environments where there's a lot of disruption uh, and emergence, and where you don't want to kill emerging spaces as they happen as well. So this is the, the picture that I, I like to depict, where I think we're, we're changing from this one, which is killing the competition, you know, war metaphors, you know, whatever it is. Uh, to one uh, which is not as benevolent as it sounds on the right, but still, um, you know, can we create value for the ecosystem and the partners that we have in there? Because that's the way we're going to thrive. And if we have digital platform <coughs> ecosystems, we can do that in so many different ways, and it makes a lot of sense uh, to do that. All right, and, and again, it's, it's kind of a different way of saying the same picture, the, the enterprise is porous, uh, you know, we connect with customers, with crowds, with citizens, with competitors, and they help us all uh, create value. We don't have a hard boundary uh, on the uh, enterprise. A little bit of game changers before we go to uh, uh, further. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, if you think of digital platform ecosystems, then it gives you a different view of, of, uh, of digital business strategy. And so now, you, you know, at least to me, I think of digital business strategy as you position yourself in an ecosystem. So, you know, these are the people I deal with. Uh, 
you know, I'm under armor, so I have the advertisers, and I have I don't know who, and I have the uh, production of clothes, and and the people who sell uh, I don't know wonder uh, superfoods or what have you, and uh, then I design a business model that goes with that positioning, right? And uh, I may discover that I don't have the capabilities to execute that business model, so. I may go back and rethink my positioning, you know, and I say, well, I can't do this. And, and it's a continuous learning process. And at the end of the day, I think that's kind of what digital business strategy becomes. So that's one sort of, and it's like a yin and yang, if you will, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, is, is, is kind of one is, is generating the seeds of the other and, and on and on. As I mentioned before, you get unprecedented growth with network effects in, uh, uh, <clears throat> in digital platform ecosystems. You get the digital unicorns that you know, are suddenly worth $1 billion uh, overnight. <coughs> and uh, there's something very interesting also that it makes more sense to study exceptions rather than averages. And so at business schools, uh, we're very guilty of teaching our MBA students about averages, right? How to be a better average player, right? And so, you know, how, how can you be better than the average? And that's kind of a mentality, I guess it comes from regre regression uh, methodology where, you know, you have a straight line and then you have this little point on, on the top and you say, no, 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 that's an outlier. We don't care about that one. Let's just stick to the main event and see how we can make that line a bit better. And if you think about it, uh, maybe the exceptions in, in such cases are more interesting to study and, and more useful than averages, right? And so it's, it's something to think about. Uh, you know, we see that in, in, in you know, I'm in Southern California, so we have the entertainment industry. And the entertainment industry uh, works on exceptions, right? And so they do 10 films. One of them is a blockbuster, and the other nine are. And they try and figure out, you know, how can I do this blockbuster again. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, you have to understand how to orchestrate external networks, which uh, requires a different set of skills. I think I've sort of mentioned that before. It creates uh, porous enterprises, and you have to worry about uh, flows outside the company. We have all this open innovation stuff where strangers are providing ideas for products, and you engage with a lot of uh, different uh, parties. And then there are some other phenomena that, that occur. So something called platform governance, right? How you figure out how people participate in a platform business model becomes a strategic issue. You know, who, who is able to do what and, and who's allowed to do this and who's not allowed to do that. Uh, we, you may be all familiar with APIs and, and how it is that uh, you know, these are the things that connect apps together. And so, you know, uh, Google makes available some open APIs, and I'm sure Expedia, you have a lot to say about that. Uh, <coughs> uh, and I can go to Google APIs and, and uh, uh, use that, uh, I don't know, as Zillow to show prices of, of homes on Google Maps, and Google doesn't even have to know about it. Uh, <clears throat> and so how we govern uh, those interactions is, is a very important part of it, and, and APIs are a business, I guess, and uh, you know, what do you keep open, what do you keep closed, uh, and so forth. And uh, you know, how do you partner with all these access rules? So, so platform governance is, is a major business issue. It's not a technical issue anymore. And then, of course, there's the, the question of unbundling assets and, and what we call asset light uh, strategies. Uh, and, and I guess the Uber example is, is the most vivid one, and, or, or Airbnb, where you, know, you don't own your resources and you, you just unbundle them, and everything is, becomes a service, so to speak. And certainly, we're seeing that in, in mobility very vividly, and we'll continue to see it in other areas. So uh, if you think about it, uh, you know, again, to emphasize it, I think it's the next form of a corporation. And you can think about it as the unit of analysis if your researcher has changed. 
So rather than just looking at the uh, enterprise itself, we have to look at the enterprise and, and its digital platform ecosystem around it. Otherwise, we will miss a lot of the insights and, and the implications uh, and the strategies that go with that. Any questions at this point, or, or should I continue? And, and uh, how, how would you like me to do this? So I want to make sure we have enough time for the debate. Okay. All right. So let me... <clears throat> okay, so let me talk about uh, theoretical and methodological uh, implications, which may be of interest to some of you, but not all of you. Uh, but given this environment, should we rethink how we do uh, research and what our research paradigms are? And so there are different theory types and structures that we build, <laughs> and they have associated methods, right? And, and the reason this guy is kind of shackled and, and chained is because the, the, the methods that we use uh, actually have a lot of baggage that go with them. And so, you know, as I mentioned that you use regression, it, it tells you to ignore the outlier, right? So we, we miss that. Uh, so should we be rethinking our theory structures and, and our methods? And I, I like this quote from Niels Bohr, who was, I guess, a Nobel Prize winner, a physicist. And he discovered quarks, or quarks, or however you say it. And, you know, he said you can't observe a quark, quark using Newtonian physics. You have to use a, a different way of thinking about it. So sometimes we have to change the glasses that we're wearing in order to see things. So generally, when we used to think about IS research and digital business strategy, we used to think of three kind of elements, uh, digital technologies, and this comes from children's books, Little Miss Neat, digital technologies, you know, they always seem so accurate and precise. And, and then we have uh, Mr. Messi, the environmental turbulence, so you know, we don't know what it's going to do, it's changing, we don't understand it, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, we have the organizational capabilities, which is Mr. Mischief. Okay, oh, there's so much politics going on, I have no idea why they're doing this. And, and, and that was kind of the configuration. But we used to separate it out. And so one thought was, why do we, are we separating these things out? And why can't we sort of think of them as one big blurb and look at the patterns in those blurb rather than have these individual variables that each have an effect. So there's a saying, you know, it's called we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and maybe we're doing that by just looking at the individual variables. So we came up with this thing called digital ecodynamics, which is kind of a mess, which sort of says, supposing you sort of didn't separate these things out and had them all together, uh, what difference would that make? And I'm gonna go fast here. But, you know, uh, for those of you who are researchers, this is kind of a, a stereotypical view of research models, right? We have boxes, we have arrows, right? And we have moderating variables, we have uh, uh, mediating variables, we have independent variables, we have dependent variables. It's almost a religion, right? And. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's very helpful, it helps us understand a lot of things, uh, but it has some limitations, right? And so you, you always have unifinal outcomes. You can't have multiple outcomes. Uh, uh, maybe let me move on a little more here and just to make that clear. And so it's a pair of glasses that's very mechanical. It's like a machine. You put more here, you get out more on the other side, uh, and it's very sequential. Uh, there's also a different holistic view that you can take that sort of says, okay, I'm gonna look at this without separating out the variables, and I want to be able to look at the pattern. And maybe that's more useful because separating out these interactions doesn't help. And so there's something called a configurational approach that sort of says, Rather than look at each vari variable, uh, I can look at a set of variables as, as a predictor, right? And so, uh, you know, supposing that uh, 
uh, I uh, need to, uh, I'm a manager and I'm trying to figure out how much information technology uh, I need to use to improve my performance, right, my co company's performance. And so, you know, somebody builds me a model and uh, they say, okay, there's, uh, you know, information technology here, there's an organizational process that you do here, and, and this gives you this outcome over there. There's nothing in the world that says, uh, if I want to increase my performance, I just tweak a little more of this organization process and a little bit more of this technology and the performance will go up. It could be an entirely different configuration, right? And so it could be another set of variables that takes you from this point to that point. In fact, you know, maybe there's something that I have to elimin eliminate that shouldn't be there. Or it's, it's a very different set of configurations. And so it gives you several alternatives for the same outcome, right? And so I can have a little technology, a lot of organization, uh, vice versa. I can have a different set of uh, uh, configuration that, that, that makes a difference, right? And just in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, go, go quickly here. But think of it as a pizza, right? There are different ways to make a good tasting pizza. Maybe cheese is always there. You know, you always have to have cheese. But the other elements, depending on what you want, will change, right? But it's more useful uh, to look at the pizza as a whole than to start thinking, okay, let me look at the effect of mozzarella cheese, or maybe that's not a good one, or peppers. And so that's the idea there. And until recently, we didn't have good methodologies for doing that, and then in the last, uh, 10 years, I guess we have this uh, methodologies that people have uh, developed. Before I do that, let me just uh, make a comment about the different types of theories. And so if you think of uh, these uh, variance theories or correlational theories, like the one with the boxes and the arrows, it's a very Western way of thinking. It's like a machine, you know, you've got the input, you, you, you know, you get the output, there's an invariant relationship between the cause and effect. You have the cause, you get the effect. You know, what's, what's, what's so complicated about that, right? Uh, so that's kind of one way of doing it when you separate out the variables. And for many things, this is a very useful way to, to do things. I'm not suggesting we discount that. And then there are what you might call process theories, right? And I call these Middle Eastern or maybe Southern Mediterranean, no offense to anybody here. But basically it sort of says, well, you know, we had the input, but hey, something happened and we didn't get the output, sorry, right? You know, something happened in the organization. And that's kind of how process theories are, are thought through. We studied this so temporarily and this happened and this happened. And they're still useful. I mean, that's just. And then this last one, which are configurational theories, uh, is very Eastern. So a lot of the, the, you know, our PhD students who come from Asia are much more comfortable with that, uh, because that's kind of how they tend to think. And and I think that's what configurational approaches do. They sort of say, you know, if this is a messy situation, let's look at this whole configuration, and figure out how to think through what variables in that configuration make a difference without separating them out, right? Uh, and I'm going to uh, skip this, but it, it's got all kinds of uh, versatility. It allows you to have, as I mentioned, <laughs> equifinal outco outcomes. So you can have the same performance with different configurations. Um, you know, and it turns out that the number of configurations is very limited. It's not infinite, right? Uh, and, you know, in any organizational setting, uh, you know, maybe there are five good ones or seven. Uh, it's not 7,000. Uh, and then it allows you to, to, to think of discontinuity, right? And so it's not linear anymore. I can go from here to here by changing uh, the variables. And uh, there's a whole set of methodologies that does that. If you're interested, it comes under a fuzzy set qualitative comparative analysis. And it allows you, it shows you 
which variables are important and essential for configurations and which are not. And, uh, you know, there's a whole website. You're welcome to go, to go through that. Um, and uh, it, it is, uh, you know, it works. And, and uh, the implications for managers are, are much easier to see than with these independent variable, dependent variable uh, models. And, and typically, the, you know, here's an, or, or, uh, 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 an example. Uh, and these are the different parts of the configuration. And it gives you five solutions here, for example. And each of these solutions has these variables in, in, in different amounts, right? Or, uh, so for example, the, the big black circle says that this uh, variable here, or this element, is core to this. In order to get this outcome, you need this thing. It's very important. Whereas uh, the ones with the, oops, with the cross sort of said, you know, if you want this outcome, you mustn't have this variable here. You know, it's not going to work if you, if you have it, right? And, uh, you know, if you're interested, uh, uh, I think there's, there are a number of references in, in the paper and there's, uh, that I, I provided, and there's an example as well. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, just to, to, to conclude this part here, you know, there, I think there are many uh, exciting opportunities in digital platform ecosystems. I say IS researchers here, but it's true for marketing, for strategy, for organizations. I think it cuts across the board. But I think we have to be prepared to embrace different types of theory structures and and, and different methodologies. Maybe the ones I presented are not the ones, but certainly we have to think through other ways of uh, <coughs> uh, doing research. Okay, let me talk about, okay, what about AI here? And hopefully this will open up the debate. So, uh, you know, I've often figured, tried to figure out what is AI, right? And you hear 700 different ways of it being said, and I'm sure there are experts here who will correct me. But, you know, you sort of say, oh, well, it's a computer algorithm that improves its capabilities by learning and continuously analyzing its interactions with the environment, whether this is machine learning or deep learning or, uh, you know, but there's certainly learning that goes on uh, and it's more than fly-by-wire. We used to have this thing called fly-by-wire where, you know, there are airplanes that are so unstable in the military that uh, pilots can't fly them. A computer keeps it stable, and it's called fly-by-wire. And, and so when, when an AI algorithm takes over, you know, that's kind of fly-by-wire. But it's more than that because the fly-by-wire doesn't have learning in it. And, and so, you know, what is AI? Now, the other question I think I'd like to ask, what is not AI, right? So is, it, is this just the 2019 hype envelope, right? Okay, we've been using big data now for five years and industry is getting tired of it. And so why not call it AI and put you know, big data inside AI for now and you know, let's, uh, let's, talk, let's have this you know, be the, the driver. Or is there uh, you know, something else going on there? And that I think is, is part of the debate here. And of course, as I mentioned here, they're soul sisters, so they amplify each other. Uh, a, you know, AI works well because you have all this data, and, and so you know, there's a certain connection. But what is not AI? What is it that, that is not AI? Is any algorithm that learns AI, is that it? Or you know, is there, and does it matter, right? Maybe splitting hairs around that doesn't really make any difference. We kind of have the general, uh, yeah. Uh, and sometimes, you know, names give, you know, a general feel for, for the field, and that's useful. I was just relaying that I was talking to somebody uh, about smart city projects, and he said, please don't use the word sm smart city, because it sort of implies that other cities are dumb, and I don't like that. So, you, you know, everybody has their, their thing with, with names, and, and so th that's kind of one question I hope we will debate here. And then the second question that comes to mind is, is it useful to differentiate between the different forms and stages of AI? Or is that like splitting hairs? You know, we're just you know, doing this exercise. So we talk about assisted AI, 
and we talk about, you know, which make those things more efficiently or faster or what have you, and we have augmented AI, which will do things that you couldn't do before, and then we have autonomous AI, which will kick you out and take over. Uh, you know, that's, that's and, and uh, you know, if you look at the uh, uh, autonomous mobility literature, you see all kinds of different, okay, self-parking versus I don't know what, and, and they keep categorizing. Or are we going to go like the way of the web, where we had web 1.0 and web 2.0, we're going to have AI 1.0, AI 2.0, and they say, no, 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 you don't understand. This is AI 3.0. It's different. You know, let, let me explain to you. And is that useful or it's a waste of time? And, uh, you know, maybe you have to be more contextual. So is it about automating business processes or finding insights or engaging with customers? Maybe that's the, the way we think about it. Or is it all about predictive analytics? So, you know, how useful is it to sort of cut and splice and, and differentiate between different forms of AI to understand what is going on. And then just to bring this back to the digital platform ecosystems again, is it just that with all these interactions that I talked about in digital platform ecosystem and different business models, is it just that we just have more complexity, right, and more big data. We have all this data that's coming now from all these areas, and it's kind of business as usual, really, but it's just bigger and messier. Or is there something different that we need to worry about? And I hope you'll answer that question. Uh, whereas, you know, if transparency is important and we're involving AI, and AI is not always very transparent, are we getting ourselves into trouble? Is there something different here that we need to worry about uh, that uh, is specific to AI rather than just more uh, messiness. And before I, I stop and get into this debate, I have this uh, little video uh, just in case you think that digital platform ecosystems is not coming to your industry, right? So I'm sure there are many skeptical people who will say, yeah, that's for Expedia, you know, I, I sell industrial gloves or whatever, it's never going to come to me. Uh, and in case you're part of that uh, group, you know, this is my answer. Let me uh, stop here, and I don't know whether uh, we do the debate or we, uh, we have questions or, uh, please. Hi, everybody. Um, happy to be here. First, uh, I think for me it was really interesting because I was not sure when I just arrived, but I can relate with uh, really a lot of things that have been said uh, by you, also by the students' uh, uh, subjects, like all the three subjects are things that are going on in, in Expedia, but in a lot of uh, data science and AI companies. Uh, so yeah, I can relate to a lot of things, and I think the, the questions are, are quite interesting to try to answer. I'm afraid I can't uh, answer the questions, but I can help, uh, um, like, emphasize the, the importance. I think the first thing of uh, digital platform coming to us, uh, hopefully not smashing us, but just like uh, coming, I think it's interesting because Expedia, uh, by design, by what it is, it, it's a platform. It was, it was created actually, it's also a spin off from Microsoft, it's just for the story. But basically, it started as a listing of hotels and a customer would just like search for a hotel. So it was a platform because it was putting in contact uh, customers and hotels. It was a platform, but 
it was not like uh, the strategy was not a platform. And it's quite interesting that lately our previous CEO actually moved to Uber and the new CEO like started uh, like six months ago. And uh, at that moment, we became a platform. So now in the vision in principles of, uh, of Expedia, we are the world's travel platform. So it's interesting to like, we were already, I think, a platform, but now we consider platform as our core strategy. And I think that's, that's really interesting because it's new. And, and it's true that it comes at the same time as uh, the really big push on uh, AI data science. So what's for sure, it, it happens at the same time. So is one causing the other or the other side, or is it just like contingent that they, they happen together? But for sure, they, they are here at the same time. Uh, I think in Expedia, there were already data science uh, within the teams, but now they created an AI lab, more or less at the same time that they push for the strategy as a Expedia as a platform. So I think that's, that really tells us something, and that's, that's quite in line with what you were explaining. Um, the other thing that for me was quite important was uh, all the idea of digital uh, eco-dynamics. I think there is a word that came like a lot of times and that I relate to is a uh, mess, messy. So I've been told that uh, it was a flow, it was something to avoid, we have to be organized. And actually now the mess is my job. So it's like, and I think maybe that's related uh, of the like rise of AI of data science is like when, when you have like millions of data, like it's a real mess. And actually the job of any data science, any AI is to clean the mess of the data and I think that's where really data science, AI, like whatever the, the strict definition, comes into place. It's like such a mess in the data, in the, in the platform, in the industry, that you need something to really uh, get you insights that you wouldn't be able to have with like the previous technology. Uh, I just tried like in terms of messy, complex, and dynamic, just I started uh, at Expedia five years ago, and I just listed like what has changed in the industry. Like when I started, what happened since I started. So uh, I think mobile was a big push when I started. It was like maybe 10% of Expedia business. Now it's like 40%. Some competitors are at 60%. So mobile, big change. Um, I, I'm sure you all know all the Meta Comparisons website. We, we mentioned TripAdvisor, which is actually a spin-off of Expedia, meaning we sold it and it became a competitor. I mean, uh, <laughs> um, but also Trivago, Kayak, all those players. Like five years ago, it was maybe 5% of uh, Expedia business. Now it's up to 30% uh, without even counting uh, Google AdWords. So, Big change. Then Google also, they entered the, the, the game with, uh, they have Google Hotel Finders. Um, Airbnb, of course, big one. Uh, Airbnb coming in the game, which means like Expedia, they bought uh, HomeAway, which is a, a US kind of uh, vacation rental. Um, a lot of uh, merger and acquisition. So Expedia is not only Expedia, we, we just, uh, so, we bought like Trivago, which is the, the, the meta search, uh, home away for the vacation rental, uh, some rail websites, some like different things. One of the biggest competitors uh, of Expedia is uh, Booking.com with Priceline. Uh, they bought Kayak, they bought Open Table. So like the, the, the industry is also like moving like that. And it's not like I'm just acquiring my, my competitor. I'm acquiring uh, another website, uh, meta search, I'm acquiring open table, I'm acquiring, so it's like, it doesn't go like in one single pipeline direction, it goes all over. Uh, and last thing, I think that this one is maybe more usual, but there are also a myriad of small players that come and go uh, quite fast. One will be the next Airbnb, the other will be dead in one year. I remember at one point I started, it was like, there was a new website called Hotel Tonight. So when you wanted to uh, book a hotel just for tonight, it became big. We were looking at it a lot. People were thinking we would buy them. And then two years ago, it was like, went back down. So like 
when I look at all the things that have been like uh, just in five years, I'm not talking like, uh, I think we can see that, that like really dynamic and, and changing a lot. Um, yeah, I think what it meant for, for us, and I think it's interesting is like, because I was reading the, the, the paper you mentioned and it was like really uh, business intelligence and communication. And, and I, what I've seen is like when I started even a bit uh, earlier, I, I became a business analyst uh, at Google. I didn't even know what a business analyst was and there was no data science class, at least in, in, uh, in business schools. Um, so I think also the, the, the data science, uh, business analytics, they changed the way BI was before. So I think before it was super not messy, so well organized, everybody was happy, your IT, your marketing, your finance, uh, your BI, you're just building dashboard. Um, everything for me now is messy, but messy in a good way. No, but I think my parents wouldn't understand that, but um, so now like a business analyst can do a dashboard. Uh, marketing, they should do it more, but they can understand an algorithm to do bidding on, on Google. Uh, and all that like kind of blurs the frontier between the, the jobs. So now for me, and it's actually it's a, still a debate we have uh, in Expedia is like, what is a data scientist? What is a business analyst? What is a, a BI developer? Because today, like you're a bit of everything. Uh, I code, uh, the, the BI developer, they start to look at business. So the, the engineers, they have to understand the business to, to create the, 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 the new website, the new dashboard, whatever. So I think for me, it's really like this mix of things that uh, is data science or AI. I see it as, okay, it's a mess. We have like million, billions of data. Let's try to get insight from that, that are actionable for the company. Um, so then I tried to make a quick list of um, where did we have um, data science and, and AI in Expedia. And what is interesting is when I started uh, five years ago in Geneva, I think the office was like less than 100 people. Now we are uh, almost 200, so we don't have space anymore. We have to change uh, uh, buildings every two years, which is a mess. Um, and uh, so I looked at uh, what has increased and uh, we started, I think, between business analysts, we were maybe um, 10. Today it's like 60, so it's multiplied by six in five years. We are even having troubles uh, hiring people in, in, in Geneva. Data science, I think, was the same, like maybe five when I joined uh, five years ago. And now I would say uh, 30. So also multiply by six. It's actually interesting that both analytics and data science, they grow the same pace. And now AI or data science, I think I try to separate them, but for me, again, uh, I don't like when we were say for me, you can't really divide it like that. But so for data science, we have it in the sort algorithm, meaning how do we display the, the, the hotels to the customer, which order, the pricing, uh, which is more my area, uh, how much do we want to price against competitors for the customers, for which customer. Uh, we have in a recommendation system, meaning when you look at a hotel, I will uh, propose you another one that you may like. We have uh, algorithm for SCM or um, Google AdWords and, and uh, meta bidding. We have uh, uh, sentiment analysis for, for content, for le the reviews of customers on the hotels. Um, we have uh, competitive intelligence, so kind of looking at the other competitors' data and, and bringing that. Today, we are also trying to help the hotels, the parts which are our partners, to do a better job using our data. So it really goes in this idea of platform and ecosystem. Now it's not only uh, a listing, we try to give them another uh, type of insight that they can't have from themselves. So all that is more data science like algorithm. And then the more AI in the sense of the machine learning and answering questions from customer, we, we also have it in voice recognition system. Now you can ask Alexa uh, for a hotel, uh, what is, where is my booking, when is it, uh, uh, when the hotel is opening. 
uh, you have chatbots, uh, you have image recognition, so it's a bit more on the AI side, but again, for me, it's like uh, um, all together. And the AI lab at uh, Expedia is also working on, on all those different uh, aspects. So yeah, a lot of things. I don't think I have the answers, but uh, even in the company, we are asking ourselves the question, and I think one of the big one is, how do we organize data science to be the most effective possible? And the idea of configuration, I think, in the theory, is interesting because I, I really don't believe there is one uh, way to organize data science. I think it really depends on the culture, on the company, on the way, like the history. Um, but for sure, we ask ourselves what's the best organization for, for our data science uh, uh, teams. So, yeah. with a question uh, specifically for Expedia that may be of interest uh, for us is uh, in your view you are mentioning that uh, in the hotel industry in, the, in the your work in the travel uh, there are more and more platforms more and more competitive service so if you look at in the long term uh, we may say that uh, there is emerging of a giant so it's uh, this uh, situation sustainable the emergence of different platforms that are competing but at the end the customer are the same and so also the, the network effect that the platform can uh, arise. So if uh, it's better maybe to merge uh, platforms or... Uh yeah, I think it's interesting. In the, so you are mentioning the idea of now the companies are kind of fighting to get the, to be the coordinator of the platform. And I think that's kind of what's happening now. So everybody is trying to, to build the platform and to be the, the center of the platform. Uh, Google, they, they did it quite well now, so they are kind of really like on the spot. Uh, maybe f even Facebook for the social network, I'm not that sure. They acquire new companies to keep, to stay in the center of the game. I think what's quite interesting with the, the travel industry is uh, we don't know yet who will be the, um, the main coordinator of the future platform. Everybody still wants to be. The hotels chain, like, uh, Marriott or others, they also try to build their own. Uh, I think the two major competitors uh, are um, Expedia Group and the uh, uh, Booking Group, that was Priceline Group before. Um, and so I think what's interesting is we don't know yet how it will evolve. Everybody is trying to fight for this co like platform coordinator. Um, what's interesting is we also, like now, uh, Expedia as a platform, they try to provide the service of, we have a platform to our chain hotels, meaning now we have partnership with uh, chains where they use our technology as a platform to serve their own um, system. Uh, again, we also have um, uh, Expedia Affiliate Network, which is a, an API technology that uh, uh, brings the the hotel kind of uh, feature of Expedia to anybody who wants to create his own uh, website. So there are a lot of uh, websites like uh, um, SNCF is also empowered for the hotels by Expedia. On the other side, um, EasyJet is empowered by Booking.com platform. So you see like we are partnering with other groups to bring the hotel platform to their, to their uh, websites. Uh, then we also have third party, what we call third party inventory. So other, uh, like other players that have other contracts with hotels, sometimes more interesting in terms of price. We open our platform to their inventory. So third party inventory. Um, so you see a lot of those dynamics are happening, but uh, I think nobody can tell like what it will look like even in two, three, five years. So, but yeah, for sure. People are fighting for this central position. Uh, 
Hello, uh, my name is Gregory. I'm sorry, I will stand maybe like that. I'm a digital startupper, if I can call myself like that. And uh, what I like very much in what you said, I like uh, disturbing, I, I like questioning, I like uh, harming dogmats, searching for uh, motivation standing behind certain processes, certain situations. But also I like to look for synergies. So question to you, uh, as far as I understood, you have uh, actually uh, a lot of experiences and high competences in managing communities, in um, managing social platforms. This naturally, and uh, as far as I uh, understood, there is a harsh competence within the area which we could call uh, travel and leisure industry, because more or less this is what you are in. But for me, it naturally, your competences and your abilities, your experiences, they create a huge space for synergies. Uh, if taken one step farther, for example, travel and transport, which uh, in fact for you, it's, 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 it's within your experiences, within your capacities, it's just, you know, another step left. Are you open on new uh, sectors, on new synergies? Do you do something or you are eventually interested in startups having their ideas and having their projects already in this new area? Thank you. I think it's also interesting because it goes uh, still again with the messy concept because like actually Expedia started like it's both hotels and now uh, flights so on the Expedia website you can book your flight um, the former Expedia CEO is now Uber CEO so like, I think a lot of things will still continue to happen we just uh, acquired a, a rail uh, website in US meaning we are also investing in in that kind of uh, of uh, platform, and again, it's like before we were like I, I feel like before uh, uh, companies were acquiring like either competitors or either uh, a company in the in the direct pipeline chain, and now it's not only uh, the transportation; it's like uh, booking. They bought open table, uh, so. It really goes in, in a lot of different directions and I think that the companies are trying to see, to permanently look at what are the different areas, transportation, like for sure, like um, in, in the Expedia kind of thinking, there is like, we want to transport the, 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 the customers from their home to their holiday place and bring them back. So. Uh, transport, Uber, uh, flights, all that is part of the, of the eco I mean, all that is part of what Expedia considers as its own ecosystem. So, I mean, they were already there uh, with the flight and I think that's uh, a differentiation with, uh, with booking today is Expedia through the Expedia.com website, they, they, they bring the flight, they bring a few like car rental also. Uh, we, all, we also have a lot of car rental companies inside the, the Expedia group and we are also partnering with others. So I, I, I really believe that's how Expedia is looking at uh, the ecosystem. And uh, Open Table, I think, is, a, is another really interesting um, example where you go in a direction that is really not your core, like it's not hotel, it's not transport, it's even like how do you book your restaurant for the night. And now Expedia is also on the um, how do you call that, like the, the package or visits, like now you can book your visit to go to uh, Cathedral de Fourvière, I'm not sure if this one is in the, but so they really try to look at the ecosystem as much wider than just like hotel. <laughs> I think that shows like uh, what you were saying now like the world is becoming much more like that and it's like you, you 
it's like the same for data science. Like uh, I think the innovation comes from bringing together uh, groups that we don't really have <coughs> discussed before. So. really a question maybe more a remark on your question is AI changing something or is it just uh, business as usual uh, I'm talking more about AI not from the data big data point of view but on AI from the robotics or IoT point of view I'll take two examples uh, and it's really comments if you look at mobility uh, you mentioned it with the autonomous car today autonomous vehicle is a possibility because of new algorithms slam algorithms for location and mapping but also thanks to new cameras new uh, lasers new systems electronics that can be embedded in mobile platforms at the cheapest cost with algorithms running uh, efficiently <coughs> to make the system the shuttle the car autonomous so because those technologies are emerging then new business new products and new services are emerging that are then challenging the way the cities the smarter or the augmented city and not smart city alone the way the cities are being designed because with the emergence of possibility from the technology new products come on the market and those products on the market are changing the way the the whole ecosystem in which they are integrated is, is is developed so it's a case of cities being disrupted by autonomous mobility another example is in healthcare if you look at uh, robotics uh, surgical robotics thanks to minimal invasive um, techniques today done through with robots uh, or with very high quality ai driven robots the surgeon is still in the place but the movement of the surgeons is being augmented thanks to robotics uh, and AI-driven robotics. And this is also challenging a lot the way the hospitals are being driven because through the minimal invasive surgery, uh, the patients don't stay as long in the hospitals as they used to be. So the hospital manager, they have to deal with a flow of logistics that is completely unusual and unexpected. So the way they are to manage their supply chain, the way they have to manage <laughs> the flow of patients coming in out more frequently, and the way they have to build you know, their own hospital is totally changing. So I believe that AI, you know, not only data, but also linked to mechatronics or other systems, helps pushing new products, new services that in the end will have a dramatic and hopefully positive impact on the different domains in which they are uh, sold or deployed. So I do believe, uh, but uh, maybe I've been too long in AI and robotics, <laughs> so I do believe that yes, this is somehow transforming and we need to understand how the, those new technologies and products are effectively transforming and it's not business as usual, but how can we create value, what are the challenges that are not only business challenges but also societal, social and ethical challenges should be also taken care of. So I just you know, wanted to make this long precision. Can I, can I ask a, 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 question, a follow up on uh, what you just said? Uh, so uh, w are you suggesting that we should not talk about AI for products and IoT and, and tangible things in the same breath as we talk about AI in general, uh, because we are confusing those two things, whereas you said it's not just data, right? But it's changing products, and, <coughs> and so should we, is that the distinction we should make? Uh, that's a huge question the, uh, Europe, the European Commission is asking itself today. Uh, as we mentioned earlier today, uh, the European Commission is launching its new seven-year plan uh, in 2020, which will be called Horizon Europe, and they want to put a very, very strong focus on AI. And for them, AI is a global term that is embracing uh, big data, IoT, and robotics. But if you talk to a roboticists, robotics can discuss with AI, but is not within AI. So there is really a question of semantics and a question of buzzword uh, to say, okay, let's speak about AI because it's hype, because it's trendy. 
the way we approach it in the institute and in the research centers is to look, okay, let's talk about AI broadly speaking, but make a difference between what is AI linked to data and big data, but also what is AI linked to robotics. There are, there are similarities in terms of algorithm, in terms of techniques and technologies, but uh, there are also differences. So um, I still believe that robotics contributes to AI and reversely AI contributes to robotics. So we have to think uh, about this and to embrace the value creation possibilities looking also at that. So I would favor the you know, a broader dis the definition of AI uh, if you look back at the funding fathers of AI, for them, the way they defined AI is a new scientific discipline based on the understanding of the way the brain is working to give intelligence to a machine. So they are looking at you know, neurophysics or different cognitive sciences and taking those models, apply that to the machine. So there's no, there's no link only to data because they also speak about the machine. So the definition is broader and it's a scientific discipline. So we should not forget that. So yeah, consider also robotics at some point. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a professor of uh, uh, management science and uh, I study interface between uh, information system and uh, operations. So first I need to answer one of your question about big data and AI. Uh, actually, uh, I think the big data is not uh, independent technology. Uh, AI is a major thing. Uh, this is associated with the technical features of uh, this generation of AI, so-called deep learning. So when Houston, so those uh, three professors just got uh, touring yesterday, uh, when they inf uh, uh, invented this uh, deep learning algorithm uh, at the very beginning in uh, 2006, this algorithm cannot work. Until 2012, uh, with a uh, with, uh, big data of a picture, and uh, finally we show uh, deep learning algorithm can indeed reduce the error rate uh, to a human's level. So, uh, so today's AI technology needs two things. One is a uh, deep learning algorithm, another is a big data. So this is the reason why we why in the last several years, big data become very popular. But the motivation is to support AI. So AI, today's AI, we need uh, two things. One is, uh, uh, one is uh, uh, training, training data, and another is uh, test data. So this is the motivation to, to study big data. This is our first uh, answer. Another thing is about um, uh, uh, how can, we, can, we, uh, can we classify AI in different generations? Well, the, the, if, you, if we think from management way or from a business way, indeed, uh, they, no much difference. Uh, don't much, they, when, you, when you think about whether they can change your business strategy, change your business model, in terms of technology, they are still a uh, generation. We cannot, we cannot exactly know the future, but we know the history. In the history, we can find the 2012, actually 2006, before they uh, finally make a mature algorithm, namely uh, deep learning. We can still find that generation of AI and today's generation of AI is still different. For example, based on the older generation of AI, uh, they cannot support our business model too much. But today, we have a, uh, so why, why AI become hard? Just simply because today's AI can work. Today's, today's AI can work. So, uh, different generation of AI still which influence our business model. Based on the older, uh, for example, we, I say uh, in Finland, they, uh, I, I just visited a, um, a company, they use uh, AI to do uh, rubbish uh, sorter. This was a kind of uh, social model. Uh, because uh, now in France or in United States, we classify the rubbish. We, we put a paper together, put a matter together. In the future, we don't need this because AI can identify, identify paper, identify methods. But based on the older generation of AI, we cannot have this kind of a business model. So that's, uh, that's my, my, my answer. Uh, I also have some question to Professor, and uh, this, 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 uh, this is about uh, your uh, research methodology. I um, uh, use a configuration approach. Um, I also read your paper, uh, very, very interesting paper, uh, three, three some paper. 
so basically, I use a configuration approach to study AI-enabled supply chain. So first, uh, first step, I use a quantitative to identify number of uh, configuration. Then I use a quantitative method to uh, further uh, build the configuration. I just don't know uh, how to identify the number of configuration. Uh, yes, uh, by some quantitative method, I, I have uh, some method like a, a cluster analyze. MDA, this kind of things to identify number of uh, configuration. So, for example, when you write your paper, how how you identify the number of uh, configuration? Why we identify three configuration or I, we identify four configurations? How how can we do that? Well, actually, the methodology. Yeah, the the methodology does that for you, so uh, it will take care of it and it will generate a number of viable uh, configurations that, and there are some parameters that sort of say, okay, uh, you know, these, you should consider these and just drop these. Uh, and so it will do it for you, actually. Okay. Yeah, and th that's kind of the, one of the advantages of it. So, so you mentioned the body based uh, QSA. So uh, today, who has some new method to do configuration? For example, can we, can we use uh, AI I, I, I don't know, actually. I, 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 I don't have an, I, 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 Yeah, 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 it's a good question. Yeah. And I know somebody who can answer that question. If, if you're, you know, if you're really. Absolutely, why not? As long as it's not fishing, right? Yeah. And, and so, uh, actually, one of the, the things that uh, this FSQCA methodology did, and I'm not the methodologist in the group, uh, but I can connect you with, with, uh, with, with the person who is, is involved in it. Gear Fiss, actually, is the one in the group, or, or Yonki Park. Both of them are, are much more of the methodologists than I. But one of the things that FSQCA did was, you know, you could uh, you can get patterns with things like, uh, thank you, with uh, things like uh, factor analysis, right? But it's factor analysis is fishing, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, a, that's, a right? that's sometimes this is my problem because I found a, uh, research by quantitative, uh, research results by quantitative methods sometimes is a little bit boring. But quantitative research is uh, very interesting. Sometimes uh, if I use a mixed method approach to do configuration, Right, right, right. And so uh, one of the things that FSQCA did was by showing which were core variables and which were, were not, yeah. it, it took care of that and, and there was a way to, to justify it. But if you really want to uh, you know, uh, get a lot of uh, discussion about that, I can connect you with uh, either Pierre Fiss or, or Yonki Park. I have a question for... for um, Florian, if you allow me, and for anybody else, maybe you don't know, can, uh, <coughs> and I, 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 you know, I, I'll relay it to a personal experience, or for, and, and then we'll, I'll take you there. But basically, uh, I teach a course on digital business models, or an MBA course, and a few years ago, maybe three, four, uh, <coughs> you know, when I used to say something in class, and uh, let's say in a, in a class of uh, 35 or 40, I'd have five people from China, actually. And, they, and, and these are not uh, people uh, who are Chinese born in the US, no, they're from China. And they would sort of say, no, 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 in China we don't do it this way, you know, whether it's payment or e-commerce or so forth. And then I started to notice that, you know, there was something very different going on. And so in, in subsequent semesters, I would at the beginning of the uh, semester uh, sort of say, who here is from China? I expect you to contribute to the discussion by telling us what is different and educating everybody else. And there were differences. I subsequently <laughs> also uh, uh, heard uh <coughs> Eric Schmidt uh, from Google sort of say, well, you know, there are two internets. There's an internet in China and there's an internet in the US, and they're different. 
and, and uh, you know, platforms are operating differently in those two places. It's not a question of just separation, but it's different. And uh, then I also heard uh, Kai Fu Li from China, who's into AI, and uh, he was saying, well, you know, uh, AI is thought about differently in China than it is everywhere else. So when you look at this from Expedia, and whether it's China or, I don't know, uh, Venezuela or whatever else, uh, you know, what, what do you see? Uh, do you see one global system, whether it's in uh, AI or platforms? And, and this is for anybody else also. It's unfair to. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting. Uh, it's true that I think most of the companies they are trying to see what's the right uh, business model to to go in Asia and particularly China. I think uh, again it 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 goes more towards the right partnership than uh, just trying to take the business model and putting it there. Expedia also was interesting in when they tried to. Uh, go to Europe. Like I think there is really like a, some kind of local um, vision for hotels is true too. So it was hard for Expedia to grow in Europe after they became like f number one in the US. Then they tried to go to Europe. Uh, was harder because the chains were different, the hotels were different. That's why kind of Booking.com grew so fast in Europe. And then now you have those two major players that both try to go in Asia and particularly China and they have difficulties. So that's more on the, is the other two different uh, platforms, ecosystem. Uh, I'm not sure they are that different. I think there is a, a frontier to pass. I don't think the platforms are actually that different. And then more in terms of the skills and the, um, the view of uh, the, the data science from different uh, countries. Um, Expedia is in Seattle, and that's true that uh, there is a big uh, Chinese community in Seattle. So there are, it's less true for, for Geneva, but in, in Seattle, there are a lot of uh, data scientists that are from, uh, from China, other that are uh, uh, from US, a bit from Europe. But uh, I think there we share the same kind of um, knowledge and the way we, we've learned uh, data science and AI, I think, that brings a common ground. That's why, I, me on my side, I'm not sure they are that different. I think there is like a, a business commercial. That's why Porter is maybe still a bit right. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's my view. Um, so, firstly. Uh, First, talk about the internet problem. So, yes, there are two uh, internet, there are two, two AI world, uh, Chinese world and uh, US world. So, firstly, we need to understand the Chinese and Chinese people and the Chinese so called government are very different. For example, like uh, obviously, Chinese like me, we, we hope democracy, uh, we hope freedom, we don't like Chinese uh, so called great war in internet. So, Today, uh, like uh, US and China are fighting, so-called US uh, China uh, trading war. Some people call it like that. Actually, Chinese people and Chinese government also regard in different way. We probably hope uh, uh, somehow, if Trump is really capable, they can bring freedom to us. So we don't like this so-called uh, Chinese uh, internet great war. Uh, we even don't like. Uh, just very publicly say we don't like this kind of uh, Chinese president who just visited France and the French government even bow to a Chinese president. Don't can say the democracy and the freedom of us. So, so this is the first thing. Indeed, there are two internet, there are two, there are two uh, AI world. Uh, let's, let's go back to your case, Expedia's case. In, in China, we have two uh, company compete with Expedia. One is called uh, Eno. Another is called Sea Trip, so they mainly do uh, traveling. Uh, yes, uh, so Expedia, of course, market share of Expedia in China is very low. Uh, there are not reason. The first reason, of course, is is from this trading barrel uh, for particular reason. 
Uh, actually, Expedia is legal in China. It's different from Google. Google is uh, illegal in China. So, you, so if, it's a, if, a, if a Expedia is legal, then uh, I think the reason uh, we need to pay, we probably need to uh, to check China government, but we will also need to check the uh, Expedia. I found Expedia also have pro two problem need to this uh, leading to this uh, no uh, market share. First problem, uh, the first problem is uh, associated with ecosystem. For example, like uh, like Eno, uh, Eno is an uh, enemy of uh, Expedia in China. Eno mainly work with uh, WeChat. So in China, seven million, uh, I want to say. Probably one third of Chinese will use WeChat. If you don't, if you don't work with WeChat, it's very difficult to survive in uh, in China. So this is associated with the uh, ecosystem. Another thing is, I, I will I say this. I actually just tried to ask you before uh, other question. I tried to ask you about uh, user experiences. So just like uh, you, you also study uh, user experiences. So for example, as a Chinese customer, why use? Uh, actually, I, I live in uh, Western world for a very long time, but as a Chinese. When I use Expedia, I still feel a little bit uncomfortable. Compared with uh, uh, user experiences of uh, of uh, of uh, of a uh, uh, trip and uh, you know, they probably can design the web website. They design the application better to uh, fit the user experiences. If you check about some other uh, 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 application, for example, a very typical example is uh, Amazon face uh, Alibaba. Of course, there's not a political reason uh, why Amazon cannot uh, go very well in uh, in China, but there was also uh, uh, design problem, user experiences. Uh, just give you far, uh, give you an example. For example, if you buy something in uh, Alibaba, you have a lot of information. Uh, you have many pictures, and uh, uh, interaction is also very uh, information is also very rich. You can read. Uh, uh, comments, several rounds, comments of customers on these products and service. But why, uh, why even in uh, uh, France, certainly I cannot use uh, Alibaba. Why use Amazon? I immediately feel you can always find uh, in terms of user experiences. There is always some di difference between Amazon and Alibaba. I mean, the the design level of uh, Amazon is always a uh, little bit. Uh, just a little bit worse than Alibaba. Mm -hmm. So is Expedia. I think probably you need to uh, infer some many managers on big data or on, uh, actually this was also been known to marketing research or information research to improve user experiences. This is another way, so why the market share of Expedia or like uh, Amazon in uh, Chinese market or in Asian market uh, is, is not, not that high as that in United States or in uh, European Union. Uh, I think it's interesting because we make a case of China because it's almost compared to the countries in Europe, like it's a, it's a continent country. Because when you think about it, it was hard for Expedia to come in Europe. It was in each individual European country, you have also this cultural and user experience difference. When you look, you mention uh, uh, eBay or Amazon, in France you have Le Bon Coin. Like look at we look at the user interface, like UX experience of Le Bon Coin, compared to Amazon, you're like, that. they are different. Of course, like France is less a big market, so you better uh, get the Chinese market right than the French market. So I, I still believe like, it's, like there are different cultural differences that all the companies that want to be worldwide need to tackle, and it's hard. And that's why like on, on Europe, Expedia is not as known as in the, in the US, and that's why they bought Hotels.com, which is a UK-based company, or was, and UK was more similar to Europe. Then for, for China or for Asia in, in overall, um, Booking.com, they bought uh, Agoda, which is Thailand company, but that helped them to get into the overall Asian market. And I think this idea of partnership is the right thing to do. Also, like uh, so far, Expedia was not that strong on, on mobile, and the uh, Chinese or Asian market are much stronger on the on the mobile app. And you mentioned WeChat. Uh, like, I agree on you need to to see the market uh, locally, and for that, the the ecosystem and the partnership, I think, is the the way the companies try to to tackle that. We I think that we we had. Uh, a partnership at one point with C-Trip. Like, 
I think the companies, they will stay different, but they will start to have partnership to help them understand a, a local market. Of course, China is a huge market, so everybody wants to get in, but like every single, like India is also a special case, which um, uh, is interesting for travel. Like, so I think, yeah, they, they try to use the, the platform ecosystem as a way to, to get in those different uh, markets, which have their specificities. Uh, they are WeChat, they are Lombo coin. Uh, so yeah, they, I think ecosystem and platform, uh, that's why it's, uh, it's growing is because it's a way to tackle, I, I think, this, this, those challenges. So we are uh, two o'clock, mm -hmm. we, we keep the time, and uh, thanks uh, for, uh, first of all, to the two speaker. Thank you greatly, and uh, <laughs> well, uh, Thank you. And uh, before uh, closing, thanks uh, to the three students coming today. Uh, I remind uh, the next uh, event is uh, a conference uh, in April, on April uh, 16. It is on the Paris campus. We will have uh, Yaming uh, and uh, other university and companies discussing uh, emerging, uh, experiencing new intelligence. So it will be focused exactly on the topic we started discussing at the end, uh, on uh, how AI can create uh, new experiences, how new intelligence can create uh, new experiences. And uh, inside the seminar series, the next event will be on uh, April 29 with Jerome and Yassin who are the research fellow inside the research center. They will present the first uh, uh, progress of uh, their two research. So you are all invited, and uh, also for those coming from companies, please uh, invite or uh, forward the invitation also inside the company. Thanks, thank you, Omer, thank you, Florian.